Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Kalurgis, and I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Miami and the Beaches Hotel Association. And I'm delighted to present to you our, our fabulous, a very timely topic, how to achieve and sustain operational excellence through a prolonged recovery. I'd like to thank very much our host, David Rubenstein, president of Carpedia Hospitality. Thank you, David, so much for putting this wonderful uh, uh, panelist, panel group to, together today. And I'd like to, um, to also acknowledge my team, Fahima Garcon, uh, she's in charge of marketing and events, as well as Monica Walker, who's in charge of membership and membership relations. So before uh, I give it, hand over the mic to David, I'd like to also acknowledge our board chair who's on the panel today, Florencia Tabini, who's Vice President of Operations and Development for MDM Hotel Group. Thank you, Florencia, for all that you do for us and, and looking forward to hearing um, this wonderful conversation today. So take it away, David. Thank you again. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate it. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Rubenstein, President of Carpedia Hospitality, and I'm very excited to be with you all today and hosting this panel. Uh, I'll introduce myself and my firm quickly and then pass it over to the panelists to, to do the same. Uh, so Carpedia, we partner with many of the world's most recognizable brands and owners to help achieve operational excellence, to help in their pursuit of operational excellence, which is, of course, the topic of today's discussion, and as Wendy mentioned, very timely right now. So to us, that basically means achieving a measurable improvement in not only financial results, but also enhancing the guest and the employee experience in concert. So true op operational excellence is moving all of those indicators in the right direction, which in our experience can be done simply, or not so simply, but really by uh, reducing and preventing breakdowns, whether those are breakdowns in the delivery of service, or breakdowns in the tools that leaders use to plan, execute, and measure performance against volume. So you'll, you'll hear those common themes, I think, as we cycle through the Q&A and hear from the panelists this afternoon. Um, but that's, the, uh, that's kind of the overview. We'll touch on many of these elements. So I'm very excited about today's panel and today's panel discussion. Uh, we have had the pleasure of working with all three panelists over the years and uh, excited to have them together. Not only do I uh, know them to be very insightful individually, but I'm also particularly excited about the diversity of perspective that comes with today's panel, uh, whether that be in terms of organization, uh, individual roles, and even properties and property types. So I think that will shine through more than anything as we uh, chat today. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask them each to individually introduce themselves as well as organization roles and uh, touch on just to level set a little bit about the status of their respective properties at this point in time. So why don't we start with uh, someone you're all or many of you are very familiar with as Wendy mentioned, the uh, chair of the GMBHA. Um, Florencia, and then we can go to Randy and Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Florencia Taveni. I'm the Vice President of Operations and Development for MDM Hotel Group. Uh, I've started working in this industry more than 25 years ago in my home country, Argentina. I started working for Marriott International at the first Marriott Hotel in South America, the famous Plaza Hotel. Then I moved to Rio de Janeiro to open a JW Marriott in Copacabana. And 18 years ago, I have moved to Miami. I fell in love with the city and I stayed here. And now I consider Miami my home. Since then, I have been working for MDM Hotel Group. Our group is based in Miami and has been in this market for 30 years. As part of our portfolio, we have the JW Marriott Marquis, the Hotel Boar, which is part of Autograph Collection, the Miami Dayland Marriott, the JW Marriott on Brickell Avenue, and the Courier at Dayland. My role is to overlook the overall operation of all our hotels, including sales, revenue, and marketing strategies. I also oversee all the projects involving hotels and restaurant renovations. 
Our hotels are currently closed, but we're excited to announce that we're planning the reopening uh, of all our portfolio by mid-July. So we're very excited to resume operation and welcome our guests in a safe environment. So I look forward to a great panel today. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Brandi Torbert and I'm the Senior Director Operations and Planning with Merit International, which is a very fancy way for saying workforce management. I have been with Marriott uh, just celebrating 16 years. A lot of that was spent on property in sales, marketing, revenue management, human resources, and just a few years ago switched to the above property role right after spending a lot of time with Carpedia and leading the operational excellence effort for two hotels in Orlando. Really excited to be with Miami today. I'm actually born and raised in Miami. And when Florencia was saying Dadeland, I know you were talking about hotels, but I spent a lot of time at that mall with my mom growing up. So it's, it's a sweet spot for me. I'm very excited to be here today and looking forward to the hour. Good afternoon all, my name is Michael Rock. I'm the Market Vice President of Asset Management for Host Hotels and Resorts. Uh, all, all of us have some merit in our background uh, on the panel here today. I started in 1985. I worked for Merit for 27 years and 16 different jobs and was a general manager a few times over of JDB Marriott in addition, Ritz Carlton Brands. Uh, I've been with Host Hotels uh, for the last seven and a half years. Host Hotels, for those of you not familiar, is a REIT, a real estate investment trust. We do not operate our hotel, hotels. We have other managers like Marriott or other managers manage them for us. We are the world's largest lodging REIT, um, and we consist of um, iconic and irreplaceable hotels in urban locations and major markets and destination resorts. Uh, and speaking of resorts, that's my area of responsibility. My portfolio consists of 13 resorts, eight in Florida, five in Hawaii. Um, currently, of my uh, uh, eight resorts that are uh, in Florida, seven are open and accepting business. Uh, we have the, uh, the Orlando World Center Marriott will open in July. Uh, and in Hawaii, we have uh, two, ho two assets that are open, the Hyatt Maui Residence Club and the Hyatt Place Waikiki on Oahu. And my three large resorts on Maui still remain closed, the uh, suspended operations, the Fairmont Keolani, Andaz Wailea and the Hyatt Regency Maui, and a lot of that's because they have a 14-day visitor quarantine. Um, and uh, pretty brand diverse, the portfolio. Uh, while, while Host is very heavily focused on Merit International brands, uh, my portfolio is a little more diverse. I have uh, a one hotel, I have two Ritz Carltons, two Hyatts, an Andaz, three Independents, a Fairmont, a Hyatt Place, a Hyatt Residence Club, and the world's largest Marriott. So it's, it's a bit of a uh, Baskin Robbins flavor of brands and operators. Um, in, uh, in my current portfolio, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today because I think all of us get to articulate the lives that we're living right now as we start to recover from COVID. David, I have bad news for you. Okay. I'm already not following the rules. <laughs> I already skipped my whole portfolio. <laughs> okay, we can go so back. I'd be happy to share that. So I do oversee all of North America, but the reason that I'm here today is I have a special concentration on Florida specifically. Uh, and then a few Southeast luxury properties. So I am responsible for 40 hotels in Florida. Um, and of those 25 are currently open. Oh, and a few more coming online over the next several weeks. One of them being the World Center. Perfect, thanks for catching that, Randy. So what we thought we would do before looking forward and then even further forward is to start with a bit of current state here. So the first question for the panel is, given where your properties are now, whether they be open or preparing to open, what are the biggest operational challenges that you've either seen so far or anticipating? And why don't we start back with you, Randy, and then we can go to Michael and Florencia. Sure. So if I think about it from my perspective and the work that I'm truly responsible for in that scope, and when you're looking at labor, it's a huge factor when you're looking at profitability for a hotel group of hotels and the big challenge that I see in my space right now is the volatility of forecast so if I give you an example I was looking at a few of my hotels this past week looking for planning just for this week we had a forecast change in a matter of four days anywhere from 30 rooms for one of our small hotels to almost 300 plus rooms for one of our larger hotels 
And that's just from a Monday to a Friday. And so when you think about labor planning, that's quite a big, a big spike that they're having to deal with on a weekly basis when it comes to labor. Two weeks ago, that was a much smaller variability where it was around 30 rooms to 100 rooms. So even from a week to week, it's very hard to forecast because it's constantly changing. And with all of the different things going on right now, you really don't have a consistent pattern that you can follow. So that's one in the, in the room space. And then the other is you follow that same volatility and that's happening in our food and beverage outlets. So for us and my team, we've really been focused on taking what we used to do one time a week. We would look at the forecast once a week and automate, you know, automatically push that into our labor management system. We had to quickly shift that thinking and now we do it twice a week. So we give all of our properties their weekly forecast on a Monday, and then we re-pull and populate that information for them so it's pushed out on a Friday. So when they go into that next scheduling week on Saturday, they have the most current forecast to schedule with. With our food and beverage, we used to use just the same time last year. What were the patterns like? What were your group rooms like? When we notice this downturn, we can't use last year anymore. It's completely different. And so we started using a, what are the past three days look like in our food and beverage outlets and take the average. Well, if I'm talking to you, which I am today about Florida, you'll know that Monday through Thursday is somewhat the same. And then all of our food and beverage covers are spiking that Friday, Saturday. And so we can't just use the last three days because we'd be constantly three days behind what you're actually seeing in your outlets. And so we've quickly pivoted now to look at same time last week. So what did Friday look like last week? What did Saturday look like last, last week? In order to give our leaders who don't have access in one place to all of that data, a single point of reference to then do labor planning when they're looking at their schedules. Excellent. Michael, you wanna take it from there? Uh, yeah, it's about balance and uh, and the volatility that, that Randy so aptly pointed out is exactly there. It's about finding the right balance of providing enough facilities to meet the guest demand, which has uh, been swinging wildly and very unpredictable these days, balanced with the profitability equation. Uh, and and look, my answers are going to be resort skewed because that's what my portfolio is. So if I was if my if my portfolio was all urban downtown hotels, I'd probably have a different lens. Uh, I would tell you it's about the Trevpar lens, right? It's about total revenue and making sure that the outlets and the things and the amenities that we're opening, we're doing it to drive incremental cash flows on the path to positive EBITDA. That is what it's about. So I, I think that it is about the balance. It's about, I think for the Florida resorts, uh, we have two plans. We have the weekend plan of what we offer, and we have the weekday plan of what we offer. And those are different based upon what Randy had said. You've got some fairly consistent occupancies, and you have some big spikes up. And so you've got to be able to kind of expand and contract your staffing and the services offered to meet the right balance of making sure that we're being as profitable as we can, but still giving people a good resort experience. Yeah, for us, it's similar answer as Randy and Mike, but the biggest operational challenge is planning for a future that is uncertain with projections that are constantly changing based on factors that are completely out of our control. As we're all aware, many hotels have drastically reduced their workforce. I believe that being able to quickly acknowledge the recall of employees needed uh, for a fluctuation in demand will be key on successful in managing the operation. Our sector is experiencing huge financial losses around the world like here in Miami. Uh, as hotels are following their checklist for reopening, the ones uh, on more advantage will be the ones that aggressively pursue responsible sanitation standards, not only for the actual safety of the guests and staff, but also for the ability to provide assurance of the highest standards of sanitation. I think that's the main challenge that we're experiencing right now. And of course, uh, having hotels that are open right now, we're using these uh, best practices. Our hotels are currently closed. So we're learning from all of them. So you all mentioned forecast very appropriately. As you start to look a little bit further out into, let's call it the midterm, what are you expecting, or at least guessing at this point, as far as volume and mix? Maybe, Florencia, we can start just back with you and then go to... Michael and Randy? Yes, we expect the first three months of opening to serve as a revamping period while customers regain confidence in traveling and feel comfortable venturing out of their homes. 
That's why it's so important to get it right, I think. At the beginning, we expect occupancy percentages uh, around 25%. We don't have resorts, they're all urban hotels. The majority comprise of leisure travelers driving a range between 100 to 500 miles. We do have some uh, corporate regional meetings that are eager to resume operations and get their business up and running again. But regarding the social market, which is very important for our properties, most of the big galas have already moved to 2021. However, we are seeing an unexpected increase on demands on with the wedding segment for 2021 and for the rest of this year. So I think love is in the air now. <laughs> yeah, it, interesting. We're seeing the same thing. Uh, is uh, the one thing that seems to be most resilient for is is small group social, right? So weddings and bar bat mitzvahs. Uh, less so on family reunions because of the generational thing. But yeah, I think I think about this in terms of segments. Obviously, leisure transit's your first one to come back. That's a matter of people feeling comfortable to Florentia's point and them having the income to spend, right? But it's also very drive market oriented. The long haul, long fly market is going to be up against headwinds um, and perception issues for the, the short, perhaps even mid or long term future. So drive market leisure transient coming back. And then behind that, you've got some relaxation of business transit to small degrees with some companies. But again, it tends to be just for like really, really super essential travel. So that's not in mass. Group, smaller groups are going to come back before quicker, bigger groups will. Um, and citywides, unfortunately, are probably the caboose on the train. Uh, I don't think anybody can figure out how to do a citywide that occupies, you know, 10 or 20,000 hotel room nights in a big city. Um, given the, the social distancing requirements that are out there in major markets today. So I think your mix is going to shift. I think everybody's going to play more transient. Uh, I think if you're in a market where you can get crew, uh, crew becomes valuable. In, in uncertain times, you want certain business is one of the, the hallmarks of our uh, mix strategy, I think, for everybody. Uh, and certain business means crew when you can get it, and it certainly means group when you can get it to layer on base because the other factors are a little more um, susceptible to the winds of change. Listen, if I could tell us what this was going to look like in a few months, I think I'd be making a lot of money right now. Uh, I know in my portfolio specifically, we rely heavily on group business and we're not seeing that yet. And so I think that's going to be a big driver when, just as I think we're starting to come back, um, we still have a lot coming towards us. We know in Florida, things are still rising. Uh, we know that hurricane season is here and it's active. We had another named Storm. And so it's anybody's guess. Um, what's truly going to happen, I think what's important for us and, and you as hotel leaders is to make sure that you continue to stay flexible and you have the right processes and, and things in place so as it shifts one way or the other, you're as prepared as possible for whatever that next step is going to bring us. Great, thank you. Uh, Michael, you talked in when you were talking about operational challenges around what you're offering and what your guests are looking for. Wondering if you can get a little bit more specific in terms of what you're seeing so far and potentially preparing for as far as what what services guests are wanting versus not wanting and what how that's impacting your plans. Yeah, certainly. And you know what? It has evolved hugely over the last five or six weeks from what it was. So this is a very different answer than I would have answered had we done this panel six weeks ago. Um, let's get down to some nitty gritty. Um, some of it also varies by tiers, right? Let's talk housekeeping, right? At the look, you know, for, for up or upscale and down, most of the properties are taking an opt-in strategy. In other words, we really don't plan on cleaning your room during your stay unless you really, really, really request it. Uh, and then we only want to clean it when you're not there for obvious reasons. Uh, so that means your stayover uh, labor dedicated to stayover housekeeping is much less, but you probably have to shorten people's boards on checkout when they check out because those rooms haven't been touched for two days. So they're, they have a little spring break feel to them over the weekends at times in terms of how customers are using that room. Uh, so that's, uh, so housekeeping luxury, everybody wants it cleaned every day. Up or up and down, I think they're very flexible to an opt-in strategy or don't worry, or what I call the TNT, towels and trash. So we're seeing a lot more labor dedicated to running stuff to people, right? Run up some towels and take out the trash versus actually doing a stay over clean uh, is much more the norm except for the luxury tier. Um, valet parking, there were people that pronounced the death of valet parking two months ago, including a lot of experts in the parking industry. 
Uh, valet parking take rates are exactly the same as what they were pre-COVID in my portfolio. So the people that are wanting to self-park are wanting to self-park for the same reasons that they always did. They're more comfortable with it. They don't want anybody else driving their car, or they want to save a, some money, or they don't want to tip, or whatever their, their issues might be for choosing self versus valet. That's been a surprise to a lot of people that valet take rates did not go down. Um, food and beverage, it's so much around this, you know, two months ago we were all courtyards. So we, we all, you know, everybody, maybe you're a Ritz Carlton or a Fairmont or whatever you were, what do you have? We got to grab and go and that's it. And a couple of months ago, everybody was okay with that. As long as they could find somewhere to get a sandwich and a bottle of water, they were fine. Um, you're seeing that evolve now where customer expectations are much more uh, demanding. They're, what do you mean all of your restaurants aren't open? Uh, I'm coming here, I'm paying luxury rates. I expect all five restaurants to be open for dinner so that I can have my choice. That's up against some of those profit balancing acts that I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I think it's the Don Cesar Resort is a great example in St. Pete Beach. Uh, we have two properties up there, and they were able to stay open throughout this. So six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, people would call and say, are you open? Yes, and they would book the room for the weekend. Now they're calling all the resorts in Florida and asking, what do you have open? It's a very, very different conversation because they are expecting when they go to a resort for all of the bells and whistles. They have been trapped with stay-at-home orders. They're emotionally um, liberated when they get out to a resort, and they want to experience the resort and all that it offers. And if you can't offer all that it is, uh, it's been interesting. My last piece on this is, you know, consuming differently and adapting service. Cleaning and cleanliness are extraordinarily important these days. And I will tell you, all of the major brands and all the major operators have terrific plans that they're all executing, be it whether you're Hyatt, Hilton, Accor, Marriott, whomever you are, to clean and make sure that you're providing the guests as clean of a product as possible to, to combat any risk of COVID. That being said, that's not why people are making their purchasing decisions because they, they're assuming that all of you are doing that because everybody's done a good job of communicating that. So it's become a little bit of table stakes. So the reason they're choosing to stay at property A versus property B are the same reasons that they chose pre-COVID, right? It's, it's loyalty, it's, it's brand, it's comfort, it's prior experience, it's reputation, it's location, it's facilities, it's compelling food and beverage, all those things that, that are out there. Um, are the reasons that people are choosing to stay at Resort A versus Resort B because they're assuming that both places are darn clean, and they are. Lorenzo, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, similar answer, uh, but flexibility and adaptability to the current needs uh, of our clients are key. Service offerings and available food and beverage outlets have been scaled down in our portfolio to meet the initial occupancy projections but while ensuring guest satisfaction and expectations. I think we need to be strategic about our offerings uh, with the resources we have at our disposal. Uh, it's important to listen to our guests, uh, as Mike is saying, but foremost to meet their needs of feeling safe so they can relax and enjoy their stay at our hotels. Yeah, it's definitely a balance between the safety of their guests, of our guests and truly of our ladies and gentlemen, our employees versus what the guests think that that means. Um, we have seen in the food and beverage space, we've definitely, we're kind of phasing. So we have this grab and go to Mike's point, this grab and go mentality. We're slowly shifting into this grab and sit. Um, so maybe it's still packaged. So you're not, you don't have hands all over it, but you can take it and sit. And then eventually we'll get into the sit and stay. And so through that, we'll have to kind of flow and see, see where that takes us. Um, and then as far as housekeeping, we are not offering service every single day at this point. You're right. Um, I agree with, with Mike and Florencia that, that we're not doing that on a daily basis right now, but certainly accommodating when the guests want that and taking that a step further to what we're now calling resting rooms. Um, so we used to call it rolling rooms. If you didn't have enough staff to clean, you'd roll rooms to the next day. Now we're intentionally resting those rooms after checkout. So a new, a new way of looking at some old things that we used to do. Hey, David, I'm going to throw in one more thing, too, that I think is important, and it has to do with what I would call food and beverage uh, sales for occupied room. Uh, is it, we're seeing that customers, when they are coming to the resorts, they are sitting at the pool and the beach and spending money all day long. So the sales for occupied room are actually far above normal. 
because people are they're getting out and they are spending money. They aren't going out on excursions. There's some, a lot of markets that's not available. There's not museums and other shows and things to do. So they're going to the resort and they are camping by the pool or at the beach and eating and drinking all day long. And so your your kind of your food and beverage capture per occupied room is actually really high, really high at the resorts we're seeing so far. Uh, Randy, why don't we stay in your wheelhouse a little bit here and talk about labor models. A lot of the forecast mix and preferences discussion that we've had so far obviously has an impact on how you look at your labor models moving forward. Maybe talk about some of the things you're seeing and doing so far. Yeah, so I actually, um, a few things. One that I wanted to highlight is this total workforce approach. So previously, as a company, when you look at productivity, we were really measuring the amount of hours that we were using in that hourly space. And when you think about true profitability and what we're spending in labor, we're taking a much more holistic approach to now include all of the management hours as well. Um, to get a true picture and be able to really benchmark day to day what one hotel in Florida, I've got several in the beaches area, what is one hotel running? All of their labor with their occupied rooms and then looking right down the street at a very similar like hotel to make sure that we're truly using the right amount of staffing all together instead of just looking at hourly or just looking at management. Um, so that's one approach that we're making now that will continue to be as we move forward and as we continue to, to rework our labor models, the way that we did it before is not the way that we're gonna be able to do it in the future. If I look at a few of my hotels, I've got one that's running around 10% occupancy and one that's running around 45% occupancy and they can't be modeled the same way. And so when I look at minimum staffing levels, that's something that I'm highly concentrated on right now is in the past, we knew we had to have two or three people at the front desk at all times. Yes, we still have to have somebody at the front desk, but is it always that same minimum that we want to start with? And so we're really redesigning and starting from a zero baseline and taking the minimum labor standard, that hour that you need is zero, and then really working our way up based in these different occupancy increments, uh, knowing, again, what that range is across hotel to hotel. Um, and then it's interesting because I think it was just this morning I was on a call with some of our HR team and we were talking about the, the way that we do things. And so moving forward, I think we're gonna have a much less specialized approach. And when we were talking, we were talking about some of the different jobs in the front office and this HR leader had said she was working for Publix over the last few months while she was on furlough and how they are a true workforce innovation company. And what if we modeled ourselves a little bit like that? Could we do it for this department? And it's so great to take something that likely is, is not wonderful for all of us. This is a hard time. We're going through a lot of hard things but how do we take this moment of uncomfortableness and change and use it to find new best practices, push the things that someone like myself walking through the hotels, people would go like that, like, oh my God, Randy's coming. What new thing does she wanna talk about? What process does she wanna change today? And I think now we have to be much more open-minded that those things that we were scared of or uncomfortable with in the past and the way that we look at our business, how we staff ourselves, what our processes look like, now is the time to really dig in and take that opportunity to push those forward while we have the chance. Lorenzi, what do you think? I think, David, you are the expert in labor models. We learned so much from you in the past, so we're looking forward to learning more in the future. But our labor models have been adjusted accordingly. The entire organization understands that regardless of title of position, we're working together as one team. And the number one priority is our guest satisfaction. I use a lot this word flexibility, synergy, and adaptability will be key in this new phase. Everybody will be helping in all areas of the hotel and supporting those departments that may need additional assistance. Michael, anything to add from the owner view? Well, look, yeah, I echo Florencia's comments. I, I think uh, when we've worked with Carpedia, it's been terrific uh, findings that we've had in efficiencies. And and uh, and by the way, uh, at all of our host hotels where we have Carpedia, uh, guest satisfaction has gone up as we have found efficiencies and not down, which is the natural inclination. People think that by being more efficient, you're going to give a lower level of service. And we have the data has proved that to be, and working closely with David and his team, the exact opposite. 
Um, I think the, the staffing uh, models that Randy mentioned is exactly right. It's reexamining everything. It's starting off and not how do we do it and what do we do. It's starting from the ground up. You know, everybody had to figure out on the way down during COVID how to manage a hotel at 4% occupancy, something they'd never contemplated in their life. Well, now it's how you apply that going forward with your labor models. One of the things that um, I, I think has always been a strength of host is because we have so many different operators and so many different brands, uh, we, we take, whether it's from the Marriott model or Hyatt or Hilton or Fairmont or other operators, and we put that into a host model that has different levels of occupancy for the recovery, and we can compare um, hotels cross-brand, cross-market, different operators, uh, and then look for anomalies and look for what makes sense. And that helps find us, you know, the best way to a new normal. And this, the, the idea that Randy was referring to of cross utilization is the new norm. It is about finding your five tool player, your front desk manager, who also used to be a restaurant manager and interned as a housekeeping supervisor. That person's more of a keeper now because you kind of need somebody at times on lower occupancies to be able to cover multiple positions on the same, on the same field. Um, I think we're pushing all of the major operators to really reconsider the whole, you know, uh, Dorman versus Bellman versus front desk versus concierge. And how do you make that one, one position so that you can move the troops as you need to around the playing field. So, uh, and I think everybody's been very responsive to it. I, I think one of the nice things about uh, my boss describes this as you remember the movies where the aliens invade and all of a sudden countries aren't fighting each other. They all, they all lock arms and fight the enemy. Um, I think that's what our industry is doing right now is we're all locking arms to figure out how to make this industry uh, survive and how to get it back to profitability. And therefore everybody's working together with, they've always, it's always been cooperative, but there's a heightened level of cooperation right now amongst all of the different operators and owners than what I think we've ever seen, at least since I've been in the business, which started in 1985, and that's been a while. So I think certainly the creative thinking is fantastic to see. Um, beyond that, from more of a tools and technology standpoint, Florencia, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Uh, anything you're working on or seeing that you particularly liked so far? And then we can go to Michael and Randy on that as well. Yeah, I think we live in an era of technologies that become the norm for each of us. Sometimes we, we are not even aware of the presence, but now it's hard to imagine uh, what our world would be without it. Yes, technologies are here and they're here to make life for both uh, the hoteliers and the customer easier. We should use them to our best. So in our hotels, we have the Marriott Mobile Key app that is available in all our properties. This allows guests to check in and check out remotely. The app also grants them the possibility to order uh, food and beverage before arriving to the hotel and during their stay. We also have the remote control that will be available through an app on mobile phones, so you don't need to use our remote control. Uh, we have the QR codes that you, you can use it you know, for restaurant menus and also to display hotel information and allow us to update information at all times. And we have the live chat that will give us the possibility to communicate with the guest in real time. Michael, you want to take it? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly right. It's how do we use the technology to be more efficient and also make the, comfort, uh, the customer feel more comfortable. So it is about mobile key and check-in. It's about app ordering. Uh, it's about technology. You mentioned the QR codes. I'm, I'm writing a, we, we do an internal newsletter at host and I'm writing a food and beverage article for the next edition. It's gonna be called the death of menus. Uh, because I think what you're seeing based upon this, in many jurisdictions, they're legislating that you can't have permanent menus. You need to have paper and disposable and th th there's a cost there and they don't look good and everything else. But these scanned QR codes, that you have on the tables or at the hostess stand is the way of the future. And everybody that like, they're not sure about it and you show them how it works, they're like, oh my goodness, why would I ever want a menu when I can just do this and I can see everything on my phone and order it that way. And so I, I think that certainly lends to that. The other thing I think that we're looking at uh, very seriously is to supplement mobile key and these other technologies is check-in kiosks. Uh, if any of you have been to some of the large hotels in Las Vegas over the last few years, you may have seen these check-in kiosks. Um, I think you're going to see more people that were hesitant about exploring that technology, digging in more to its potential use. Um, I, I know I've checked into Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas on Friday of Super Bowl weekend, 
um, and they had two people working the front desk that were for problems or troubleshooting, two. Um, and they had about 40 kiosks out there. And, and by the way, the kiosk uh, makes sure and write, asks you all the right questions every time. It doesn't know any different. It was a flawless check-in because it's a computer. So it, it offered to sell me different types of upgrades. It offered me a green choice option for a casino credit. Uh, it offered me all the stuff, and, uh, and that, was, that was a couple years ago. And so I think it's out there but not been widely adopted, and I think some of what's going on in this crisis is a nudge to get us to adopt technology at, at a higher level. I hope so. Yeah, I would agree that it's a lot of these things are out there. The mobile check-in is not new, but as much as people would sign up for mobile check-in, they'd still stop at the desk to collect their keys. So I think what this is doing is pushing some of the technology that already existed. It's getting more usage. The other thing that I can add that hasn't been talked about yet that we're specifically looking at in our in our Marriott hotels is contact tracing. So we talked a lot about the things on this call that are available for our guests. When we talk about contact tracing, we're looking. So if someone is um, does come back positive with COVID, we have the ability to instantly go, okay, who else was working during that shift? So we can ensure that we inform all of the employees that were there that day that worked in that department that happened to be located in that kitchen at that time to make sure that we know exactly who could have come into contact for their own safety as well. Excellent. So I, I do see uh, lots of great audience questions coming in as well, which we do want to get to in the last sort of 10 to 15 minutes. So looking forward to some of those. Uh, just before we do that, we thought we would just look out a little bit further. I know on a lot of the panels and discussions that I've been a part of personally, there's, there's a lot of looking forward and it's sort of deemed as the silver lining question, if you will. What are, what are going to be the long-term impacts of some of these changes to the way that hotels are operated. In other words, what might stick for the benefit of longer term operations? Uh, Michael, why don't we start with you and then we can go to Randy and then back to Florencia for the last word on that one. Sure, well, let's hope the light that we're starting to see at the end of the tunnel isn't another train, first and foremost. Let me get that out of the way. Uh, but if you think about the uh, applying, it's about applying the learnings that we're seeing. Um, you know, the, the unfortunate reality uh, is uh, of our business of people serving other people is we will not have enough business to support all those people for a while. And so while there are people who have been laid off, uh, furloughed and, and severed, uh, there's probably more of that coming in the short run. There's probably a phenomenal amount of that coming across our industry in the short run because we simply looking forward will not have enough business to support all the people who used to work at our hotels. Um, and so I think it's about then laying out what is truly necessary as you ramp back up? And I will tell you, things that are out there for amenities, um, you know, some of the food and beverage operations in downtown major market urban hotels that operate at a major loss in food and beverage, um, I think you're going to see those operations remain shuttered for the foreseeable future. I'm, I'm, I feel fortunate I'm in a different location with resorts, uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of that that just doesn't quite come back. I think you're going to see a lot of zero-based cash flow outlet analysis. In other words, if I'm opening a spa for the weekend because people wanted it open, great. What would you do over the weekend? Well, hair and nails are really busy, and we did some treatments too, and that's kind of been the story so far. We're doing a good level of treatments, and hair and nails, you better reserve before you check in or you're not getting a spot. Um, but then we need to run some profitability analysis on it and, and figure out does it make sense and how does it stay. Uh, it's making sure that we sustain the operating model changes that we've made uh, going forward. It's real easy to fall back into the good times and add back layers and add back uh, positions. And the problem with that is you're eroding the long-term road to profitability. It's all about the path to EBITDA. And then once you're in positive EBITDA, it's all about the path to normalcy um, and, pr and prior peak of EBITDA. So I, I think monitoring cross creep is going, is always been an important thing in our business. I think it will be, um, absolutely on the front burner with high flame from an ownership perspective for the next 18 months. Of any time that we want to add and do things back, there's going to be a lot of um, return on investment, critical analytical thinking, and business calculations to go, I know it's a nice thing to do. Can we afford to do it? So you've got to be able to sustain your new operating model with a lot less um, leadership, more nimble, more cross-utilization, 
And, and this is not just a property down decision. There's also all the major operators have made significant changes and will continue to make significant changes above property. And it's making sure we, we're very vocal about making sure we're applying the same lens uh, on property as we would above property. We need the right level of support. We need the right level of service, but we're not in a financial position as an industry to get extravagant. It's unfortunate that this, the longest uninterrupted RevPAR growth cycle is met with this kind of a crisis where it's more cataclysmic than any of us could have ever thought. But that's where we get paid money to make the tough decisions and to work through as an industry and work together on making sure the operating model stays as efficient as possible. Yeah, I'm gonna, I wrote down what you said because it was what I was going to say, so I'm just gonna say it again, sustaining the operating model. That's, that's gonna be the number one thing that we wanna take out of this. We've always had ideas and we've always wanted to make change and we, we didn't always have the best environment to do it in because we've always done it that way. Well, guess what? We've never done it this way. And so I know I've said it on almost every question I've answered because I so wholeheartedly believe that there has to be a positive in this and that's being able to take this change that is typically so hard and change it to the positive and then sustain it all the way through. Don't creep, don't get the summer school slide that my boys are probably going through right now being out of school already um, and really take this and use this time to slow down, figure out what the right way to do this is going forward and then put those processes into place in a way that is really sustainable. Yeah, as you said, Randy, the advantage of an unexpected and uncommon situation like the one that we're living today have allowed our company to reevaluate every layer of the business from top to bottom. We rewrite the SOPs, reallocate budget funds to areas where we receive the most impact and eliminate programs and offerings that are not longer relevant to our clients. And also we repurpose spaces and areas of the hotel to be multifunctional. Some areas in technology that were perhaps before considered a luxury, uh, they will be incorporated now. Few will be considered a necessity now and key moving forward. Obviously, the implementation of cleanliness and sanitation protocol, the frequency and the staff training have become some of the most important aspects impacting our operational budget. But I think we know that in the long run, everybody will benefit from this investment. So, Wendy, I know you've been monitoring very closely to the Q and A uh, chat box coming in and uh, sifting through for some of your favorites. Can you share with the panel what you're seeing? I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. <laughs> I was so excited working behind the scenes. It was really, uh, it was great, and you were all wonderful. I. I, first, I, first off, I, I want to share with you that uh, Mike Hampton from FIU Chaplain School, FIU, who used to be the dean at Chaplain School of Hospitality, wants you all back in the fall, including you, David, to do a session for the students. So I'm going to reach out to all of you for that because that was that's a really a great opportunity to spend time with students. So um, we have some great questions. Um, on, one is on guest compliance, which we're going through right now here in Miami, is, is how are you planning to encourage or are probably already in, in doing compliance from hotel guests to meet regulated mandates, i.e. wearing a mask, uh, where we're already seeing a lot of our hotel guests don't want to wear facial coverings. Go ahead, Florencia. I had the hotels no? close, Mike, so I think That's you know, right. tell, us, right. tell us a little bit about best right. practices now. All right, so it, it, here's the thing. It really varies by your, your local restrictions and what restrictions are in your area, right? The, you know, the vast majority of markets do not require um, uh, guests to wear face masks if they're just out in the open. They, they may have some different requirements with regards to, you know, inside a restaurant, as you, like I know here in Miami, as you're entering, you have to wear a face mask. Once you're seated, you could take it off. Um, you know, and, and it just, look, it's, it's cautiously and friendly reminding people to comply with what is out there. Um, and then if you have people that are just brazenly uh, ignoring what is there, well, then you have to kind of turn up the muscle level on the conversation and realize, come on, guys, I've asked you twice now to break up. There, there's 15 of you here. 
you know, we can't have that. We, we've got to maintain it. Um, some of it's also done physically through prior planning and preparation. You've got your pool decks and your public spaces and your restaurants and your bars and your, your beach areas are all spaced out to provide for maximum thing there. Uh, and then you have to deal with it like you would deal with anyone who is um, flaunting the rules that you have inside your operation, which is the first request is a nice ask. Um, and each subsequent request gets a different muscle level to the ask. Um, and, and look, there's jurisdictions. I mean, Miami beach sent out an order today saying, look, if your people are misbehaving and you're not enforcing it, we're going to reserve the right to shut you down. So I, that, that's, there's teeth to that. And therefore there's motivation for hotels to make sure that they are honoring whatever is required in their local district. Same as any other rule, I guess. Thanks, Mike. Anyone else, Randy? Got it. I don't have it. He's, he's good. Good answer. <laughs> Check mark. <laughs> Next question for Mike. Come on, Wendy. I know. He's ready. He's ready. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us how often you are disinfecting um, common areas or guest rooms too, and what methods are you planning to use or using for Mike? I mean, I looks like Mike wants to go, go ahead, Brandy. You're welcome. I nope, was just going to say, I mean, nope, every home, you got it. Sure. Every property is a little bit different. I was on the phone with one of the hotels last week and they had 27 different checkpoints that they have one person. All they do is hit each one of those checkpoints, scan the barcode over and over and over again. And that's, that's their job during the day. I know there's been a lot of testing with the electrostatic sprayer and there has been some thought that it's in the rooms and I know that some recent studies have been done where maybe that's not the best way um, and is to not do it in the guest room and so it's really going to be more um, public space focused. So I'll tell you something today as we continue to learn more things are continuously to, to evolve and change but as of today at 2.31 p.m. Eastern time that's, that's where we are. Yeah, we are close, Wendy, but I think working on the labor models, staffing guidelines, you know, we realize that we need to have more people now for cleaning, especially in public areas. So for us, we know we're working, you know, with the Marriott protocols, checklists, trying to make sure that we cover all the areas of the hotels. But, you know, for sure, you know, it has changed the labor models, you know, based on this situation. Yeah, I think we probably anticipated when you think about we're not going to be doing a stay over in every single room every single day. Well, then we should have an instant savings in that labor productivity because we're not using those hours. But I don't think it's that simple because we're going to have to take some of that labor and really move it to continuing to have the public space cleaned more often. So it isn't a one for one exchange on that. There has to be more work to really understand how long does it take? to hit those in that property specifically, those 27 high touch areas and go through hotel by hotel to make sure that we're not just saying we don't need them anymore, but that we're really making the vested time to use the hours where we need them and redistribute them in a more, a more um, impactful way. Yeah, agree. It, it is about redeployment. It's also about its brand specific and operator specific with regards to what chemicals and what the exact procedures are. Uh, it's also property layout specific. Are, are you an up and down hotel of, of 600 rooms in a fairly narrow footprint or are you on 450 acres? Um, I, I, how you tackle and how you sanitize and how you clean and the amount of touch points uh, that you have to employ very greatly based upon that. So it's a little bit of the snowflake answer because they're the same, but they're all uniquely different. Um, but I think that is the reality of it. Thank you. Okay, so here's a fun question for all of us because we are, we're all itchy. We're all itchy to go somewhere, right? So uh, are you all offering staycations for Florida residents? <laughs> I'd have to go to Marriott.com to tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you that our beach locations are and driving locations are very popular right now. And so as a Marriott employee, uh, I'd be hard pressed on the weekends right now to find a rate that is something suitable enough for me to pay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. There are obviously discounts are out there based upon everybody trying to find their right mix. That being said, I will tell you that um, holding to rate is an important priority right now. 
because, uh, and, and I was saying this back in the middle of March, so I get to keep saying it again. All my hotels have heard this for three months straight. Price will not overcome fear. Um, and so dropping your prices will not make someone who is not comfortable traveling decide to travel. All you're doing is negotiating down against yourself. So holding to rate integrity uh, is important. And I will tell you that thus far, most of my Florida resorts um, – Rate is up year over year. Now, some of that's mixed because group is out of the equation. It's purely transient rate. But even if you just go transient to transient, it actually is slightly up. Uh, again, luxury having more pricing power, up or upscale having a little less. Uh, so I think there are packages and discounts out there that are fairly widely available in the industry. But it's much more of a Sunday through Thursday thing. So that's my advice for all of you out there who want to get out and spend some money. Your deal is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday stay. Uh, if you're coming on a Friday or Saturday, you're probably paying the same or similar rate that what you would have paid last year. I think they can stay during the week with you and then come to our hotels during the weekend. Uh, we, have, <laughs> we have packages, yes, for uh, Florida residents, including Valley Park in breakfast. So we didn't lower the rate. I agree with you. That doesn't make, you know, create any bank. But we create a nice package, you know, especially for the reopening of our hotels. If it'll get me back to Dadeland, I'm there. <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, the other thing that, that Randy mentioned, too, is around the weekends and popularity and the forecast. It's also made kind of revenue management and pricing decisions extraordinarily volatile. I mean, we're throwing levers right and left because there's no predict, predicting exactly what's going to happen. Um, uh, I, I'm, I have a... Ritz-Carlton Resort, uh, the golf resort, which right now just has a private group piece of business it's in. We open the public on, Jan on July 1. Uh, by July 3rd, we'll be at 70% occupancy. Uh, so that's, that's going to be incredibly busy, incredibly fast. Uh, and that's not with huge discounting. So there, there is, I'm kind of getting, I guess, what I think the soul of the question is, which is about demand and dynamics and pricing. Um, and there is demand that's out there. Is everybody running equal occupancies to last year? Of course not. Nowhere near. But are they running occupancies that can probably get them to cash positive fairly quickly with the new operating models? Yeah. Yeah, but a part of that's just making the right decisions and realizing it's a bit of a roller coaster right now, and who knows when the next dip and turn is going to be. So I like, uh, Mike, I liked it. I like, I wrote it down, heightened level of cooperation amongst the operators, which I think is really great. And, you know, we're very lucky to have all of you with us today. And I also wanted to acknowledge our partner, Bill Talbert, the president and CEO of the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. And Bill and I have probably been texting on the phone, on the webinars, on different webinars throughout since March, since, since, and I wanted to acknowledge that Bill, I know he's watching us um, as we speak. Uh, David, you are amazing. You, uh, you put together an amazing uh, group and your talents are really just, uh, I, it was great for me, even though I know you, I, and now I really understand all of the things that you do for our industry. And we really appreciate you putting this dynamic uh, group together. Um, looking forward to all having a glass of wine together soon. And um, thank you so much. Do you have anything you want to add, David? Sorry, I was on mute. Thank, thank you to you and Fahima and your uh, organization for putting this all together. Definitely concur. Special thank you to all the panelists for taking time out of their busy calendars to participate and offer their perspective and uh, enjoyed chatting with everybody. And just to echo Wendy's sentiment, look forward to seeing everybody in person, hopefully very soon. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll all be together really soon, right? We can do part yep. two keep, as well. <laughs> yep. Keep the faith, everybody. Aloha. Okay. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.